It's Comics are Great, the visual storytelling show, recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk with cartoonists about cartooning, about making comics, writing comics, visual storytelling, all the stuff, comics lifestyle, all the stuff that goes into this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist, and boy, oh boy. Is this going to be a good one, guys? I'm set. I'm I'm jinxing it now, but it's good. I don't. I don't. I think this is unjinxable. I think with a roundtable of this magnitude, you are guaranteed an excellent, excellent show, conversation, roundtable discussion. I'm going to announce my guests. If you're watching live on the video or watch the video after the fact, appearing over my right shoulder now is Tony Cliff of DelilahDirk.com. Hi, Tony. Howdy. Uh, DelilahDirk.com hitting stores in August. Uh, Delilah Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant does come out on August 27th. That's correct. August 27th, and the Seeds of Good Fortune is available now at Delilah Dirk. Uh, yes, it is. Store's down right now. Uh, I'll be fixing that uh, shortly. Well, by the time this episode actually hits the podcast feed, it'll be fixed. I'm sure. I'm certain of that. I'm confident. De I have faith definitely? in Definitely? Sure. <laughs> yes. All right. But yes, one, one of the greats of the comics firmament. Tony Cliff is here, and I can't wait to talk with you about action and comedy. Speak of comedy, uh, one of the funniest people in comics is appearing over my shoulder. Again, Chris Houghton of ReadGunther.com. Hi, Chris. Hello, Internet. One of the sweetest, <laughs> kindest, funniest people you could ever Aww. meet in comics. And then uh, also from Reed Gunther, we've got, well, we had to get him. I mean, it kind of comes with the package of the Chris Houghton. It's <laughs> Shane Houghton of ReadGunther.com. Oh, hello. <laughs> Not the sweetest, nicest person you've ever met in comics. <laughs> but one of the funniest people in comics. I should say the Houghton brothers are also known for their work on Bongo Comics. You guys worked on some Simpsons stories together. Uh, also, Chris, you're doing the Adventure Time covers right now for the Adventure Time comics, yes? That's right, yeah. And Shane and I did an Adventure Time uh, backup story. Oh, and what issue? Uh, what was it? Issue 9. Oh, yeah, number 9. So, cool. Well, people have to check that out, too. Uh, then where would they find out about that? Uh, where to get that? Where, where, what's ReadGunther.com is where you guys post all your news, yeah? Or is there someplace else I should be pointing people at? Yeah, ReadGunther.com yeah. is the best place. Um, yeah, if you have any Adventure Time uh, comics, Chris probably drew the cover. And then in Issue 9, uh, the backup story is by both of us. And, uh, yeah. And it's, it's colored by our Reed Gunther colorist. So it was the full team. Wow, the band's back together. I should say, though, we, Reed Gunther, I mean, Adventure Time is awesome, but Reed Gunther is about a bear-riding cowboy. And whenever I say that to people, it's I true. see that look of recognition of, oh, of course, where has this been all my life? The bear-riding cowboy <laughs> who solves people's problems, goes from town to town like a Wild West hero on the back of a bear. Sometimes you just come up with an idea that seems so natural. You just feel like, oh, that's, that should have been around forever. Where, and like you said, where has this been all my life? <laughs> that should it's be true. a thing, yeah. Yes. You know, and it's funny. Most people come up to me at Comic-Cons and they say, oh, my gosh, I love Adventure Time. But Reed Gunther is incredible. <laughs> and then they, they never talk about Adventure Time again. They're like, what? <laughs> no, let's talk about Reed Gunther. So I like that segue. <laughs> also, you know what? I'll bet Reed Gunther's a lot easier to cosplay than Adventure Time. Just saying. Amen to that. Amen to that. <laughs> I know, Sterling. Oh. We, once, we were at a Comic-Con once, uh, and we, were, we had never seen a Reed Gunther cosplayer, but we were, like, waiting for the day. And we saw a guy that we knew named Chris, and he was dressed up in, like, he had a vest on and the cowboy hat, and well, he was looked just Chris like Schweitzer. Uh, no, it was Chris, um, uh, his last name starts with a K, it's KW something crazy, uh, he's an animation, oh. Oh. but he was basically promoting his own Western comic and oh. not Reed Gunther, <laughs> <laughs> and we just thought, we were like, please, you know us, you know the book, and he's like, oh, I've got my own thing, it's, it's Bleed Munther. <laughs> <laughs> oh, comic conventions are always full of heartbreak. Uh, it's I about a cowboy riding bear. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> True. I should say that we're, we're collecting links to all the stuff that we mentioned in the chat. That's at webchat.freenode.net, the, the hashtag CAG channel, if you guys want to join us there and uh, participate in the discussion. I'll be watching it and relaying your questions to the guys. But we've got a topic today, a big one, because I think the common denominator between the three of you guys is dynamic fun, visually fun storytelling. Uh, and Tony, you did a visit to the Ann Arbor District Library a few months back 
uh, to the Ann Arbor Comics Artist Forum. Uh, a are, virtual visit. A to virtual the magic <laughs> of the internet. <laughs> he was a ghost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, and you did a talk on, uh, you know, action in comics. And I think, Chris and Shane, you'll be able to chime in on this too. But I wanted to let you kick it off, Tony, because you had a lot of really clear lucid and uh, I think interesting thoughts on and, and anybody who's read to alert to, uh, uh, Matt do we have any of the images from uh, the comic that we can pull up on the screen while we talk about this uh, from DelilahDirk.com Maybe. Sorry, I did not prepare that far in advance. Uh, oh, with the no. Skype guests, I was quite <laughs> concerned about making that work. Oh, that's okay. But people can go to, to Deliladirk.com while they listen or watch this and, and, uh, and flip through some of the pages to see some of these awesome action sequences. But I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Tony. That, that is a good idea. Though <laughs> multitasking really reduces um, comprehension. So. <laughs> let's, let's increase your cognitive load before Tony loads you up with some really, really interesting thoughts. Uh, well, first, uh, Chris and Shane, uh, what's your guys' background? Um, uh, judging by Reed Gunther, uh, I, I would have guessed there's some animation in there somewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I work in animation during the day, and um, well, and now both Shane and I are working on some animation stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah, I've uh, worked at Nickelodeon, and now I work at Disney TV. And uh, yeah, I think that I've always been into animation, and, and it's, it's seeped into, the, into my comics, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Um, because Jersey, when I ended up talking to you guys, what I, I, I feel like I was basically going through a lot of the um, animation principles that I picked up in animation school, uh, like animation fundamentals, and sort of talking about how they applied to, uh, how applied to comics, how you can incorporate some of those ideas into comics. Um, and I can go through some of that, too. Uh, Jersey, you also wanted to talk about um, some story elements. And I've got this split basically into two parts. I've got your foundations for uh, some good, solid, meaningful, interesting, exciting action. Um, and I've got, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a list, or I've got to look at here some ways of, like, visually presenting your action that, uh, that makes it read, that makes it fun, that, that sort of thing. Okay. How do you want to dive into this? I want to. I want to dive into the second one. Uh, that 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 sounds interesting. Give me give me give me a, a a headline from one of those that we can start to pick apart. I'll give you, I'll give you a survey of the whole thing, and, I, okay. and I'll start off by saying a lot of this is pulled from. Uh, if anybody wants to look into this later, a lot of this is pulled from uh, traditional animation teaching that you can uh, you can look up in the Illusion of Life. It's the uh, no, is that right, Shane? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is, that's is that the right one. Uh, the Disney book, um, or the animator's handbook, or the animator's survival kit. Survival kit, yeah. Uh, the Richard Williams book. Yep. Yeah, the animation uh, yeah. survival kit. So basically, what I'm talking about here are principles of um, arcs, uh, the arcs of an object moving through air, uh, moving through space, um, anticipation, um, sort of foreshadowing a movement or an action. Uh, follow through, which is the, um, like the residual, the momentum from an action. Um, secondary action, which is uh, da, 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 tra like trailing an object but behind something that is like a primary source of movement. Um, and then some other, some other tricks like um, effects, getting and inter interacting with the environment and sort of connecting your characters to the space they're in, that sort of thing. Uh, and also uh, studying from life, uh, observing observations, uh, you know, how people walk, leaping, jumping, their poses, their facial expressions, all that sort of thing. So those, those are th I think, are the root of a lot of, um, a lot of techniques I, I try to use to incorporate to get across some really strong action. Uh, Chris, Shane, anything you would add to that? Anything you th I'm missing? Yeah, like, uh, I think also, um, you know, the movement, the movement of the page, whereas, like, in animation, you know, uh, obviously the main difference is you're staring at one screen and it's the same size panel, in a way. Um, so there's different rules for, for you know, cutting uh, and the progression of, progression of shots. Whereas in comics, you know, you're trying to move the viewer's eye through the page, um, which can be interesting and, and open up a lot of doors in that way. 
Mm-hmm. But I think like that animation style can kind of help with that movement and energy um, just in a static page, which is really yeah. cool. Well, that's the thing so, is that comics is static. We don't have the, the luxury of showing anticipation, arc, and follow-through on movement. We've got to distill ah. it down to a single image. Oh, Tony's got something. There comes the finger. <laughs> I would I would disagree I would disagree wholeheartedly with that. I, well, oh. sorry, with the with the phrasing of that. I know you're supposed to yes and. I'm sorry. I'm bad at improv. Um, I would suggest. Is everybody familiar with Scott McCloud's um, idea that all of the action in a comic takes place in the gutters, in the borders between the panels? Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like the the whole your experience of reading a comic is you mentally generating, imagining um, the movement, imagining what's happening uh, between the drawings, like basically in the gutters between each panel. Um, that's what I particularly like anticipation and follow through for. Um, so the easiest way uh, <laughs> the easiest way to illustrate. Uh, Anticipation and follow through is with drawings. Um, I do not have drawings right now. So if you think of, say, if you think of a golfer, an anticipation, or a golfer, or maybe um, a dude up to bat for baseball, uh, anticipation is winding the golf club back. Anticipation is lifting the golf, you know, bringing the golf, golf club up in preparation to strike. Your movement is, of course, the movement of the of the um, the golf club through its arc. You'll notice that, like a, a golf swing, creates that arc, and your follow through is the when he hits the golf ball, the club doesn't stop there. The golf club continues on through. It follows through because of momentum and physics and all that. Um, the way that I apply this to comics is. You you don't you wouldn't want to have a panel where it's more to me it's more exciting and it's more effective to have a a panel that shows the anticipation or the follow through or if you really want to get into your action you show both um, you build that suspense you know like a guy winding up for a punch um, <laughs> a guy winding up to to swing at the ball all those things. And then you uh, you can either show the follow through. Or you don't show the bat connecting to the ball. That's not interesting. You don't show the fist colliding with the. F- well, that is kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see what you're saying. Like the moment the ball hits the bat is not the panel that's interesting or dynamic, right? It's the moment right. just after with the bat swung all the way around the shoulders and the ball maybe like six feet away, right? Right. Or or two meters in your language. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand yes. that, Tony? Are you following us? <laughs> Guys, I can't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. It's kind of like that, uh, that How to Draw the Marvel Way book. You know, and they have all those great drawings of, um, you know, Spider-Man, like, punching bad guys. And it's like, don't draw them like this. Draw them like this. <laughs> and uh, it's always, like, after the punch. Um, and he's fully extended. And uh, it's, it's way more fun. Yeah, absolutely. I I love this idea of uh, yeah uh, separating out not the action itself but the anticipation and follow through of the action are things to consider when we're doing this. Um, gosh, we're we're already a, a ways into the show. I want to talk about some of this plot and, uh, or uh, motivation into the this dynamism too. Uh, one of the things that you've been talking about lately on Twitter, Tony, and people should follow you, Tango Charlie, on Twitter. That is right, at Tango Charlie. At Tango Charlie, because he posts really, really lovely thoughts. Uh, there was a great tweet that you did a while back. I was trying to look for it to link it in the show notes. was, uh, hey, here's a tip for writing dialogue. Write your character's dialogue as if they are being selfish, selfish motivation. Write it selfishly, or I think is the – you can say it better than I can, Tony, because I'm, I'm paraphrasing it poorly. Um, yeah, and I will start with a disclaimer that this, uh, this piece of advice, and it stuck with me for a long time, this piece of advice came from Scott Adams, the uh, – He's the creator of Dilbert, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The infamous Scott Adams with his misogynistic opinions. Uh, later. <laughs> um, I, yeah, like uh, a long time ago, I read a, a, a Dilbert book. Not, a, not one of the, script book, uh, the strip books, but one of uh, just his 
prose books. Um, and it had a lot of great points on creativity and a lot of um, really nice little bullet points on writing believable dialogue, not necessarily realistic dialogue and not necessarily good dialogue, but really believable dialogue. And one of them was, hey, uh, make your characters more selfish, um, which <sighs> if you take it superficially, it, it, could, it could seem kind of cynical. Um, but if you, if you get into it a bit, I think, um, sort of thinking about how all your characters have their own personal motivations, their own desires, their own wants, um, it, it's, it's a, I, I feel like it's a good shorthand for keeping that, that idea in the back of your head when you're writing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, related to that is never have a character answer a question directly. Um, you know, which way did he go? Oh, he went that way is fine, I guess. Um, but it, if you can come up with any, if you can come up with any sort of alternative to a direct answer, I, I, not that they're trying to misdirect, but are you saying, and Shane, I want you to weigh in on this too, but like trying to find a way that they can say it as only they would say it. Is that kind of what you're driving at Tony? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it probably Interpret just it that way. like sounds better. It's because if the, it's too direct people, audiences like to have a little bit of like they you want to have your audience ask a question in their mind and not answer it immediately because you want them to be engaged in what you're doing so if you do a question like that it's like hey where did he go the audience also thinks yeah where did he go and then if nobody responds or the other character who is being asked that question says something else it kind of leaves this mystery lingering and then you have this engaged audience but if you're always answering the question that you propose, it's like the audience is, it just zones out. They can blank out because they don't have to like pay attention or they don't have to solve it in their own mind. They don't have to think about it. Um, so I think that's where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you brought up Scott Amzo because I have a terrible quick story uh, about something I read that he wrote. As a kid, he had a Dilbert book and he wrote in the margins, little like notes and annotations about his strips. There's one thing that stuck with me my entire life and I even used it with Reed Gunther, but it's, uh, he had this little rhyme and it said something like, stalagmites might hang from the ceiling, but don't. And that's how I learned the difference between <laughs> stalagmites and stalactites. <laughs> and that's it, it's just stuck with me my entire life. That's good, that's really useful because the, um, the other rhyme for, uh, for remembering which one is which is not helpful at all. Which is? I think it's the ones, the ones that hang from the ceiling. Uh, stalag, stalactites hang, have to like hold on tight, and stalagmites are reaching for the ceiling with all their might. Might. Uh, okay. Does that work? Is that, right? is that the right way around, though? <laughs> uh, no, that's right. Yes, yeah, stalagmites are on the ground pointing up, and stalactites are pointing down, hanging from the ceiling. We all learned something today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this, this, uh, you just did a value add for the show. Thank you, Shane. Uh, <laughs> but, okay, okay, so a friend of mine once said to me, and, and where I'm driving with this, I'm driving this back towards dynamism and action by understanding that we got to care. We have to care about, like, what, what's happening in the story. Um, and, and thinking about, like, the character motivation counts. And, and something a friend of mine said that really stuck with me was plot is character in action. And it took me a long time to digest that thought. Like, what does that mean? And, it, and what I think it means, and I'd like you guys to weigh in on this. Well, I'll just say, rather than me, you know, be didactic and say, here's what it means, respond. What do you think that means, like, when someone says plot is character in action? Related to that, related to that, uh, that idea, Jersey, have you read The Art of Dramatic Writing? Who wrote it? Um, I... I I do not want to pronounce his name. It's L A J O S is his first name. It's Lajos Igri. I think you've like you've that. mentioned this book on the show before, actually. I have definitely mentioned it on Twitter and Tumblr, and uh, I had a skywriter fly across the <laughs> sky. <laughs> um, this is my uh, of all the writing books uh, I've read. This is the one that stuck with me um, the most, and the one that's felt the most true. And it he's his approach is a lot of. Um, looking into your character's backstory, developing your character's history, uh, basically making sure that you have uh, um, strong, well-developed characters, and then 
your story that you end up and he the book is mostly about writing plays but it's applicable to anything really um his thing is basically you develop your characters and from them you get your story there the plot comes from uh who your characters are basically you the, the way you put it was more succinct Oh, okay. And also, <laughs> well, I, it was I, an actual point. I, ma I make no cl claim of ownership of, of that idea. I mean, like I said, it was a friend of mine who said it to me, and, and I've been chewing on it for a long time. And uh, I, I, when I think about these action sequences, and I think about like the you, we talk about like dialogue idiosyncrasies and like like uh, movement idiosyncrasies, knowing your character becomes and knowing why they're doing what they're doing becomes crucial, right? Mm hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Shane, like you were saying, with uh, again with the where did he go character, if a char let's assume that the character responding to that is not just some throwaway background character. Um, if that other character who is responding to the question where did he go has any sort of history or any sort of background, you know, maybe that character is suspicious. Why is he asking me which way he went? Um, Maybe maybe he's covering for the dude who took off. He's like like I don't I don't know where you know. Um, I think just answer responding directly to every question uh, is I don't know. Yeah, it brings away character. Plot is character and action. I think is like um, maybe another way of saying it is story is when characters do things you know it's like it's like if you if there's a plot that somehow progresses but characters aren't taking action on it i'm trying to think of a, what an example would that that could be and the only thing i can think of is like maybe some sort of political thriller where like I don't know, even then, like, stuff is happening, but I, was, I think, like, government, and there's, like, I always feel like the government, there's, like, stuff happening that people are, like, always turning a blind eye to, but there's got to be somebody, like, making these things happen, so it's, like, people make decisions, there's cause and effect, and normally, well, always in stories, it's, like, things go wrong, things get worse, and then you have people trying to fix it or better them or do something to uh, resolve a problem, um, so, yeah. I like that. I like the way Jersey phrased it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally getting credit for this. This is awesome. Uh, no, like, so I was thinking. I, I saw the new GI Joe movie recently, which we don't have to make any statements about it. It's, it's, some people like it, some people don't. Uh, but one of the only problems I had with the film was um, Lady J. At one point in the story, they have some downtime where you know have, trying to have some character moments, and she explains her motivation for being a GI Joe. Like, oh, my dad, and this stuff happened, and he made me feel bad, and I'm trying to prove myself to my dad. And then nothing happens in the story where she's operating out of that motivation. Like, she, she explains it. She says it. But we never see her do any specific thing as a, as a pure reaction. or that's not, It's not used as a fulcrum point of any of her actions in the story. And in the end, they kind of wrap it up with Bruce Willis walking up to her and doing this like simple gesture, like a salute kind of thing, which is meant to, and, and actually he has to say a dialogue. He says like, oh, I knew your dad. This is for your dad kind of thing. And then she's like, oh, okay, well, that was resolved now. I'm like, well, it was only resolved in, t in dialogue. I didn't see, outside of her doing some awesome action sequences because they were in danger, I never saw her do anything out of that center that she claimed. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so like there's no, uh, th her journey... There wasn't really a journey. She'd already made the journey, I guess, of like, of becoming the GI Joe for her dad, or for whatever reason. I think that's the journey is her like struggling to become a GI Joe. But then it sounds like once she's the GI Joe, uh, she's made it, and like that conflict is over. And so it's I don't know. I haven't seen GI, the GI Joe movie. So sure, sure. I'm not sure, but that's what it sounds like. It sounds like the, that story has already happened, and it, it, they've moved on. Yeah, Jersey, the way you describe it sounds like it's motivation for motivation's sake because everybody's supposed to have motivation. Right. Um, so here's hers. Yeah. Even though it, it has, it sounds like well, I'm, there's I'm, no, I'm, no real plot uh, um, or story. Yeah, it, it's just there to say, like, here's some back. Well, see, because you guys were talking a minute ago about, like, you know, fleshing out your characters, knowing their background. Well, they did it in G.I. Joe, but it was not very satisfying to me. Uh, well, I guess it's because it doesn't service the story. If, like, all. if the reason she became G.I. Joe is, like, oh, my dad, and for whatever reason she's, like, living up to that, then 
in the story, they like she uncovers some information where she learns that her dad uh, like was never a GI Joe, or she discovers this new truth about her father. Then it like shakes up her world, and she's like, "Well, if that's not true, then what is? It? Am I on the right life path? Like, should I even be a GI Joe? Should I like join the uh, Co Commander Snake, the other side? You know?" <laughs> and then it's like, "Oh, now we've got some conflict and some interest and drama, and like, what's she gonna do?" And then you have this nice question, like. What does this mean? And the whole thing is her trying to answer that question up until Bruce Willis says, like, you know, like, screw your dad. Like, you're a good G.I. Joe. <laughs> because, that is, yeah, that is really unsatisfying if there's a character that's like, all I want to do is impress this other character. And then at the end, they, they do. They impress that other character. It's not a very meaningful thing. Um, like Shane said, it's like if that got turned on its head, and all of a sudden, it becomes something uh, deeper than impressing someone else. It becomes like questioning, you know, it's like, no, I'm not doing this to impress my dad. I'm, I'm doing this because this is the, you know, this is for justice and I'm doing it for myself. And this is what I truly believe in. Um, and seeing her come to that realization, I think, would be much more satisfying than just like, oh, good. She impressed that dad we never met. <laughs> uh, Chris, you know? have you seen the movie? No, I haven't seen it. I have not either. Sorry. No, that's okay. I, 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 <laughs> I was trying to use it as an example, as a springboard to say, like, I'm sure we all have examples of a film where somebody says something that really has no bearing on the actual actions of the story. Right. Mm -hmm. um, or, yeah. or where they say, like, it's like, I'm, I'm reminded of something Brandon Dayton of BrandonDayton.com shared recently, uh, a post on Stephen Pressfield's website about the stakes should always be on theme and nothing should be expressed verbally that isn't also some kind of action that the character takes, which points back to the theme. Uh, we're talking about drama, aren't we? We're talking about like creating drama. Like when you guys talk about twisting things, that creates a sense of drama rather than just a linear path of, boy, I wish my dad liked me. Uh, well, I'll do some things. Oh, he likes me now. All right, good, we did it. Uh, but, but trying to make a twist where you reevaluate your initial motivation creates a sense of tension and, and questioning, which is a form of drama, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Because all drama is conflict, and uh, so you got to have some sort of conflict. But then you can't just have the same conflict for twenty minutes because then it gets boring. So then you get into raising the stakes, and you make the conflict worse, and problems get worse, and things grow, and uh, until you get to the point where it's like this is the absolute worst point this character has ever been, and and then. They turn it around and solve the problem. But once you solve the problem, like, story's over. Like, you're done. Uh, yeah. So, what are well, the... Somebody, so, sorry, there was an article, there was an article recently um, uh, looking into maybe one of the reasons why John Carter of Mars, the movie, uh, wasn't very good. And I think the takeaway from it was that all of the... For example, if there's a fight, the stakes for the fight were explained or, or were um, introduced either immediately before the fight or during the fight, which makes it, uh, and this apparently uh, it was the case throughout the entire movie. Um, if, I can if I can find that again, I'll, I'll send you the URL. But, um, Please do. Uh, but it's an interesting idea. So, so going back to action, how does drama influence when you guys are writing action scenes? Are you thinking about that, or are you just thinking, like, you know what would be cool is if Delilah Dirk was on this bridge, and then a guy shot at it, and it blew up, and I get to draw lots of awesome debris in this really cool three-quarter down shot. Um, how, how does building the drama influence? How does it work into the action scene? Or, or is this something that you guys intuit? I guess I should ask. I think it's something, I think it's something that is difficult to do, but when you do it, it works so well that you strive for that every time after. Like, if you just have two guys punching each other, uh, it might, like, look cool, or there might be, like, more, there might be appealing factors to it that are completely visual, but if you want somebody to really get wrapped up in that story, you have to, you know, make those two guys brothers, or, um, you know, do something where it's, like, it's it's this higher level of of conflict. Um, I'm just thinking of an issue of Reed Gunther. Is we have this like uh, kind of demon guy take over Reed Gunther's body, and he becomes our hero, becomes this big monster. And then 
his friends have to fight him, but they don't want to fight him too hard because like, oh, our friend's in there somewhere. And so that's something that's more interesting than just like two guys uh, hitting each other. So I think there has to be something, I think in every conflict, or every fight scene that we do, we try to do something. I don't know if we succeed, but we try to have some sort of like underlying, maybe more emotional uh, story going on, emotional conflict, because you have this physical uh, conflict, this like outer conflict. And then to have, if you can pair that with an inner conflict at the same time, I feel like that's where the, ooh, mm, that's the, that's what you're shooting for. <laughs> that's a spicy meatball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Jersey, it sounded like you were asking a little bit about, you know, which direction do you approach it from or where does it come from? Yeah. I, I think you can come at it from both angles. I think you can, uh, probably the more scholarly individuals, probably the more sophisticated people will come at it from the point of drama escalating into, um, in, into exciting conflict and action. Uh, but I think, I think you could also start off at a, at a great idea like, hey, let's, uh, let's destroy an aqueduct. That would be fun. <laughs> and then work back from that and how does that you know, involve our characters and how does that interact with the drama they're going through, that sort of thing. Totally. When I yeah, think we, most, go ahead, I think Chris. most movies start out like if you look at like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, it's like most movies start out with if there's an action sequence near the beginning, it's just external conflict. It's just like fun and exciting and you're just kind of getting to know these characters and there's no real underlying problem. It's just like it, can they get to if it's good, they're also telling you a bit about uh, the characters or introducing themes or... Sure, yeah. Um, it, but not necessarily expo exposition, heavy. But, but showing you yeah. some stuff. Show, putting as much in there as possible. I'm thinking of Indiana Jones. Well, so, actually, yeah. 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 Like in Indiana Jones, you don't want to have him be like you know, getting ready to swap the idol. And then he's like, boy, I really need this because I <laughs> promised the museum that I would bring it yeah. back. And I hope that my nemesis guy doesn't show up and steal it, but okay, here we go. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, right. it would just slow it down. So they, it's like, we don't they, care. Yeah. And it's more interesting because again, there's like that question, you know, kind of like, why is Indiana Jones doing this? Like, who is he? And then you, you learn all that stuff soon, but it's really, really that, that adventure that gets you hooked. Cause that's the external conflict is more visually appealing cause you just get into it. And internal conflict takes time to set up um, through dialogue scenes and you have to learn and you have to remember, cause it's like, you, you don't talk about your internal conflict during an external conflict, unless like it's an old, like Stan Lee Spider-Man thing where he's like punching somebody and he's got this giant word balloon in one punch. And it's like, boy, I hope I don't forget those eggs for Aunt May right. and got to get home on time. And it's all this, uh, <laughs> God, they do a lot of dialogue and word balloons in those old like 60s superhero comics where it's like one punch like giant paragraph and then a second panel is like a second punch like two giant paragraphs <laughs> it's crazy but but you know there's something i like about that too in the sense that like the and I, I've, I've told the story before on the show but there was like one time in my life where i genuinely was kind of scared for my life and i thought ooh, this could go really really bad and I remember, and there's been studies done on this, I remember time kind of sl really slowing down. The event was maybe 60 seconds long, but it, in the moment of it, it felt like this was going on forever and I got to get out of here, you know? And I think about, like, whenever I see that, that when, the, when comics does that thing where, like, oh, yeah, this punch is only, like, takes this long, uh, but there's this, all this dialogue, it's kind of reflecting that, that elastic nature of time. I, I hate to be McCloudian about it, but... I like, no, I do like that. As long as it's like, if you, you get one, you get one moment like that. <laughs> you can't have like a three page fight scene, like peppered with dialogue and word balloons. Especially, <laughs> that's especially too, when that's it's too much. Especially when it's redundant, where it's saying like, oh, I'm hitting you while he's hitting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Take hitting. this punch to your face. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. I got yeah, he's right that down. Write, down. write that down, Shane. <laughs> This is recording, right? This is recording. Yeah. <laughs> it, this is proof that the, the idea is copyright Shane Houghton. That's uh, right. Have you guys read um, Invisible Ink by Brian McDonald? No. 
uh, it's it's a book on writing. It's writing stories, and it's 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 in the vein of a lot of the books we've been talking about. And Brian, again, Brandon Dayton pointed me at it, and he talks extensively about that Indiana Jones scene, how that first scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark is the penultimate setup scene because it sets up the exciting action, setting your expectations. You're gonna see a lot of this stuff, kids, but it also very elegantly inserts a lot of thematic elements and plot elements. We learn that he's a professor of archaeology, that he has an arch nemesis, and that he is a treasure hunter, but he also you know is doing this for the good reasons, not like the bad guy treasure hunters. Um, so that whole sequence sequence ends with him uh, with the snake in the plane as they're flying away, and yeah. it sets up that he hates snakes. And I never realized that. I just watched it recently, and I was like, oh my gosh, they really do set up everything. You know, it's, yeah, it's really efficient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jersey is Invisible Ink the one that uses the metaphor of the armature? Yes, for a story. One, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice short, efficient read. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It, it's it's uh, it's an interesting book, uh, and and there's like some really uh, weird thoughts on masculine versus feminine story elements, which he admits is like a little bit like, well, I know I'm gonna get in trouble for this one, but uh, it's it's an interesting read for people who are interested in this topic. Uh, but um, let's see. I want to make sure that I got time. I see that Aaron's here uh, for book recommendations in a minute. Oh my gosh, this show is too short. Uh, we did not get through half of what I wanted to, but I want to. Talk real quick, Tony, about uh, some of the tweets you've been doing about Ready Player One, because I think this ties into what we've been talking about a little bit. Um, I, <laughs> uh, tangentially, I, uh, regarding Ready Player One, I feel a little bad. Um, I don't know, expressing so much, so many harsh sentiments against, you know, somebody who's uh, worked hard on a book and put it out there and. And I'm about to release my first <laughs> real book. Well, the trolls so, will get you. So, know, you. karma, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But there are two things. There are two things. Are you guys familiar with the idea of um, you pick up a new book, you flip to page 99, read page 99, and that gives you a good idea what the book should be about? I've not heard this. Oh. Hmm. I like that. Um, so I had got, I got to about, I think I'm at about 60 pages through the book, but I did want to try that. I flipped to page 99, and one of the second sentences, I forgot to bring the book in with me. One of the second sentences, it's all written in uh, first-person narrative. So I did this, I did that. At one point, our, our hero says, for some reason, I did blankety, blankety, blankety. Since it's first person, you are not allowed to use that, and I did not read. I did not. I did not know that I was some sort of writing snob until I, I came across this sentence and just I, just. I probably did a spit take. What's wrong with that sentence? What's wrong with saying for some reason? What if he's not sure? I. Is it the wording? Or it, because like he could hint that for reasons that were not clear to me at the time, hinting that we will learn what those reasons were. Maybe I, guess, I think was it a big thing? Better. Was it a big thing like, like, oh, for some reason I killed my mom, you know, or was it something like, for some reason, like I left my car keys on the like top of my car instead of in my pocket. I, I always do that. It's like, is it something small or was it something like big? I, no, I think it was a relatively important thing. Um... Is this just a really hilarious book, and maybe you're not getting it? It's so not a really hilarious book. <laughs> you're just not in on the joke, Tony. If I you were a little not. older, like you I know, guess not. You... But I, I don't know. It just strikes well, me as particularly. What What I loved about that critique is that it was pointing at you know we're paying attention to why should we care in a story, right? Uh, and if you're not telling us why you're doing something, then you're not addressing why should we care. Going back earlier to what you guys were talking about, this idea that if somebody asks you a, qu a question, don't answer directly, you're, you're, that's a way to invite somebody to care. And you can answer indirectly in a way that hints at why, why you're answering that way. Uh, I, the, the joke I always tell on the show is uh, a crypt from uh, Steve Martin's movie, L.A. Story, where he's at the dinner party, and then they say, oh, uh, Jenny's learning the art of conversation. And he turns to her and says, oh, you're learning the art of conversation. And she says, yes. And there's this uncomfortable <laughs> silence, right? And that's the joke, right? But, but like, that's what you don't want to do with your characters, be too blunt about it. You have to be a little bit subtle with what those motivations are, and you can... This is the exact line here. Uh, okay. It says, she turned back. For some reason, I felt compelled to help her, even though I knew I shouldn't. Well, just give me a, a a hint of like some actual maybe reasoning, like like I don't know. Give me anything. She, she, anything yeah, other than for 
some reason. That doesn't like feel they, like something somebody thinks. That feels like a, something a writer puts down as a placeholder. <laughs> it sounds like he's trying to create some conflict where there is none. You know, it's like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, but I am. Or but, he just hasn't put the research or the effort into discovering why that character, why his own character is doing the thing he is. It's like, just, yeah. just g- give me something. Even it's like foreshadowing towards romance. Um, uh, I think it's a it's a, a character relatability thing where um, if you have a good character do something bad, or if you have a bad character do something bad, even you want the audience or whoever's reading it to relate to that character and understand the justification for their actions. So if it's a good, if this sounds like this good guy is doing something bad, maybe he has to, he's forced into the situation where like he has to do it, but that's something you need to explain. And that's okay. You can have a good guy do a bad thing. We just need to know the parameters of like why he's being forced into doing this. And that's kind of what that, that sounds like. It's like, oh, I know, I know I'm doing a bad thing and I feel bad about it, but I'm still going to do it because I have to. Not because the, the plot like, won't go forward unless I do. It's like you have to build it so he has no other choice but to do this like, bad. Or better yet, give him the choice between two bad decisions. And then it's just like, well, it's just a terrible, but that's a like great conflict for the audience to watch your main character go through. Uh, right, absolutely. Like, he... I totally get behind that. Uh, maybe I think it's just the specific warning here that strikes me as a, that falls a little short. <laughs> Chris, Chris, what were you going to say? Yeah, well, shouldn't he, uh, like, it, you couldn't you go the way of um, he doesn't know it's a bad decision, the audience knows it's a bad decision? Because, I mean, everyone lives their lives thinking they're doing the right thing. If you didn't think you were doing the right thing, you probably wouldn't do it. Or if you think you're doing the wrong thing, you have like that's the major inner conflict right there. Oh, what do they call that? They call that cognitive dissonance when you're doing something that you know is bad, but you can't stop yourself from doing it, kind of thing, right? Oh, wow, yeah. Um, make, yeah, so it just up? seems weird that too uh, smart for us. <laughs> yeah, Jeez, <Jersey. laughs> listen, Sorry. more than three syllables, I'm out. I'm trying to get onto NPR for crying out loud. <laughs> uh, no, but you, have you guys seen? Have you all seen Wreck-It Ralph at least? Have we all seen? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay, oh, the scene, and I don't want to spoil it because I don't know what the statute of limitations is on this, but there's that scene. Well, you spoil G.I. Joe, Jersey. So. I know. <laughs> the most important part of the film, trust me, you can't spoil G.I. Joe. Stuff blows up, and it ends very silly. Uh, but uh, there's that scene where Ralph has to do this thing that he knows is going to hurt Vanellope, and all signs point to, you know what I'm talking about, right? He has to, yep. yeah. And all, all, all signs in the plot point to, yeah, he's kind of got to do it. He's got to do this thing, and you know it's going to hurt her. You know it's going to hurt him, and he does it, and he hangs around that tree, and he does that thing, and it's, it, that was – whatever – however you feel about the overall movie, because I know it, a lot of, there's a lot of split opinions on it, but that scene was painful for me to sit through. Uh, I, I, it was the most emotionally rough moment of the story because, yes, he was doing something – he was conflicted about it, right? Yeah, which is why it's, it's – that's such a great scene because – it's a good character, like forced into doing something he doesn't want to do. And you relate to him and you feel for him because he's found his like first friend uh, and they have a real relationship and, and everything's going so well in a, in a way, like the, 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 word, the plot is still getting worse and worse. But like this moment that's like the dark night of the soul, they call it for Ralph, like the worst it gets for Ralph is like right here where he has to do that terrible thing to his brand new best friend who like, he, 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 that would be the last choice he wants to do. But to force him into doing something like that is such good uh, conflict and drama, uh, which is why like that scene resonates with everybody so much. Yeah. I'm getting choked up thinking about it. <laughs> that was a rough scene. I don't know if I can get through that movie again. It's like Toy Story 3. Uh, <laughs> well, we didn't get through all the stuff on action uh, that I wanted to. I've got like three pages of notes here. I think we got through about a paragraph. Uh, so we're going to have to do this again, guys. But uh, Well, Jersey, as long as we can point your, uh, point your watchers, viewers, listeners to um, some of those animation resources, yeah. uh, I, think, I think they'll all be uh, excellent additions to your toolkit. Well-equipped. 
Uh, and then, Absolutely. but yeah, we're gonna do book recommendations in just a minute here. Erin, uh, are you in the studio? Here she comes. She's waving a book at me, saying, "I am coming." So, uh, I want to while we while Erin comes in here to set up. Uh, What's going on with you guys? What, what events are you going to be appearing at soon that we can tell people about, where they can meet you and ask you more questions about these, these topics that you're so intelligent and lucid about? Well, Chris, uh, Free Comic Book Day is uh, this Saturday, I guess, depending on when this podcast drops, but uh, May 4th. Um, and Chris and I are going to be at Metropolis Comics in Bellflower, California, uh, which is just kind of south of L.A., and uh, we'll both be there from 10 to 1, signing books. I've got, uh, I wrote a story in Peanuts uh, from the Boom is putting out uh, a free comic book day. I think it's got a bunch of stories in it. I have a Peanuts story. I think Chris has some Adventure Time artwork or maybe his, you did a regular show cover too that might be showcased on there somewhere. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I've got. but We haven't seen way, it yet. Yeah, we'll have a bunch of our own books. You know, Reed Gunther, we'll have Adventure Time books, Peanuts, we'll have Shane's uh, Fanboys vs. Zombies books, um, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. And anybody who wants to see how much fun it is to hang out with you guys should go to ReedGunther.com and check out that video that you guys posted last year, or last fall. Um, let me see if I can find the the title of that video. It was... Oh, behind the scenes with added thrills where Chris and Shane make a deal with the devil to make their deadline. Uh, but before they have to do that, there's this wonderful montage of you guys just running around Hollywood having fun. And uh, it, it's I, I want to point people at this, too, who are cartoonists who are like there was some talk on Twitter recently about doing book trailers. And I think this is an awesome book trailer. Like some people say, like, oh, it's got to have art from the comic. It's got to sum up like the the story of the comic. And like there was that animated one recently um, that people were. We'll link to it in the show notes for the Kairos trailer, where it was almost fully animated. But what you guys did is you summed up. This is how the book feels. Here's the creators. Look how what fun guys we are, and look at what our sense of humor is like. And this is what you can expect from the book, right? I think so. I think that's it's a tone trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, plus, plus uh, we only had a, an afternoon, so uh, it all works out perfectly. <laughs> I saw that Kairos trailer, and I was blown away. I was like, that's for a comic? Yeah. These guys are so ridiculous. Beautiful. I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> it was incredible. But is, that, but is that disappointing? I haven't seen the trailer, but it's like, if you see this gorgeous like animated thing for a comic that doesn't move like that, uh, if it's so good, do you just are you starved for more of that animated content, or are you satisfied with the uh, like print still version? Don't. That's a tricky question because yeah. it might be a bit different over there. It's a uh, it's a French trailer for a French book that I, mm. I at least not yet is not yet coming out in North America. Um, so maybe attitudes are just different over there. Well, and my my closing thought on it as I, I it took me a whole day to crunch on it because I was kind of like oh, managing expectations. What if somebody like looks at that and goes, well, I'll just wait for the movie, right? right. Uh, yeah. You know, but then I thought, yeah. oh, that that'd be troublesome. But then I thought about it and I was like, whoa, wait a second, 1985, GI Joe comics come out and there's these animated commercials on TV. What will happen? Find out Marvel Comics. GI Joe sold exceedingly well in the 80s and I think it was a direct result of the TV commercials which were animated and I did not go to the store and go like oh I thought this book was going to be a cartoon you know so I don't know it's true. It, it's, you know what's strange about the and I don't know I, I love the Kairos trailer but what was weird was afterwards I was like oh my gosh this looks incredible I can't wait till this comes out and then that was quickly uh, exchanged with the feeling of like I have no idea what this is about. I don't know who the characters are. I don't know what the story is. Like, it didn't give me anything except, like, it just, it just like, satisfied my inner animator of, like, ooh, it looks so good, yeah. which is cool, but, like, it's really no different. And, again, this is, okay, this is going to come out bad, but it's, it's really no different than going and seeing the Transformers trailer where it's like, wow, that looks incredible. And then it's like, wait, I don't know anything about this. Yeah, and I don't give, and I love Transformers, and I did not give a darn about anybody in those movies. Uh, I shut the third <laughs> one off about twenty minutes in. I just couldn't take it anymore. I could not deal with it. So, yeah. And Kairos does seem a little more layered than Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> let's just give him that. <laughs> it's a terrible comparison, <laughs> but it's like it seems like it's got a bunch of meat to that story. Like, yeah. wow, who is this little boy? Like, what are these monsters? It seems super interesting. I just kind of wish the trailer like 
pulled me in that direction. But, um, but I don't know. Maybe they were going for a more like uh, you know universal appeal because uh, it's French. They didn't want to have any language barriers. I'm not really sure. Well, well but, at, the, at the end of the day, hey, we're talking about it right now. Yes, so. that's the yeah, big exactly. idea. It did its exactly. job. It's like yeah. it's, it created buzz for the book. That's, yeah. that's we, we can't even read it. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Amazon.fr. We maybe get it that way. Uh, but but the, this is the big idea. Is I, I wanted to point at what you guys did, Chris and Shane, uh, is that, yeah, we should be leveraging video, and it doesn't mean one thing or another. We're not beholden to any particular format. What you guys did is you made a really entertaining web show for me that I was laughing out loud at. And I'm like, yeah, I got good feelings about Reed Gunther now. You know, so I think that's what we really should be after is leveraging what you got rather than getting all hung up about, well, these guys got an animating team, so well, woe is me. I guess I can't make comics. Yeah, and the nature of everything seems to be changing. Like, you can't just be a cartoonist and go off and lock yourself in your cartoon dungeon and make your car uh, comic books all day. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, people are used to, uh, you know, taking in your work in video, on Twitter, you know, on Facebook, like uh, all of those internet things. Um, so yeah, why not, right? I think it's a marketing thing. It's like if you can, this, the toughest thing is cartoonists uh, trying to be mar like a marketing team, which is a very different, uh, very different uh, set of skills. And so anything you can do to stand out from the noise or the crowd, like if you do something different and try to be as original as you can, like that's great. If you have a book and you just did an animated trailer like Cairo, it's it's like okay that it's cool but it's like I've seen that you know what you're expecting. Um, Chris and I did a a comic book press release that was in the form of a comic. Uh, so there are panels and it was Reed Gunther telling about the news. Uh, but press releases are so boring that we were like oh that might be interesting to have like you know we see characters and they're fighting monsters and but like giving dialogue about what the news is we wanted to get out and it got a lot of coverage because it was. Uh, such an interesting or different way to view that information. So cool. Well, Tony, um, we'll Hello. get we, with your appearances in a moment because Aaron has been waiting patiently while we've been all nerding out over videos. Hey, you got your hair cut, Aaron. Aaron Helmrich of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aadl.org. We're going to do book recommendations. You guys, Shane, Chris, and Tony, feel free to bring your own book recommendations if you wanted to uh, bring them to this segment. But Aaron's going to talk about a few new exciting books available at the Ann Arbor District Library. What do you got? Oh, can I hear you? I can't hear you. So. Matt, can we pot her mic up? There's a little bit of uh, oh, sorry about inside that. baseball. How's that? Okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to start with the sad book first. But oh, you're talking about this awesome yesterday. <laughs> book. Oh, we don't um, have. We don't have the, sadness. We don't oh, have no the camera. table cam anymore. Okay. So you hold it up to that guy. Sounds good. Um, it's called Stargazing Dog. It's definitely a tearjerker, but not in an overly sappy way. Um, it's kind of, there's two stories in here. The first one is about, you know, the long, intense bond that man and dog and, or woman and dog have. Um, definitely about the human condition and the dog condition. Um, you know right from the beginning that it's going to be sad because you know that our protagonist and his little friend have not made it. Um, but yeah, it's that, an awesome. It yeah, go Let ahead. Let me hold it to my camera yeah. while you talk about it. Um, so there's page one. But here. anyway, I mean, it's the, the main story is about a man who got a dog and when he was all happy and had a family and then ended up being alone and <laughs> him and his dog die in the middle of a field. But you know that, and it's still a beautiful story. So anyway, <laughs> um, if you want to read something sad, the stargazing dog is for you. Um, I'll go on um, Relish. Oh, Apparently yeah, for there's books. now an awesome new world of... Um, Food and cooking graphic novels coming around. This one only has one blurb on it, and it's Alison Bechdel on the back. Um, I've almost read the entire thing. It's awesome. Lucy Nisley comes highly recommended yeah, on the show. Yeah, it's a nice combination of straight panel stories. Um, it's all about just food, food, food. She grew up with um, parents who cooked and had culinary adventures, but then she also has these great two-page recipes um, where she draws out how to assemble whatever it is you're making. So it's kind of an interesting So is format. it just a simple recipe book, or what are the stories? No, it's a it? memoir. It's pretty much a memoir with her musing about growing up in New York with her parents, um, all of the different cooking and food adventures they had. Then she moved up to upstate New York with her mom and had farming experience, some more direct experience with food, and then also went to art school in Chicago, 
um, when the town was really, um, you know, having its early years of being more of a culinary destination. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just an awesome food story about, you know, her memories and her family and traveling around and different kinds of food and basically about being adventurous about food. I mean, she's, you know, an omnivore, so she's eating everything. So there are, you know, meat and vegetarian recipes in there, but it it's really great. Once again, really well done. first second, everything they're doing is amazing. And I don't we, understand it. And have a nice long waiting list for that one as well. And then the last one is a series that I just discovered recently. Mm. Um, I just bought these for the library. We had one, and there's two additional ones. This is Hilda and the Bird Parade, mm -hmm. um, written by Luke Pearson. I think this is a nice description. It talks about it being a cross between Lucky Luke and Miyazaki. <laughs> Um, she's a uh, Norwegian girl who lives in the fjords, and in this particular book, they travel and live in a city. And so she's getting her bearings, and her mom is not allowing her to um, explore the way she used to in the woods. So um, they're neat. They're, they're different, um, different kind of look for some of the graphic novels that we have for kids. Well, it's, it's, it feels more Franco-Belgian yeah. in, its, in its roots, yeah. um, and, and even in the format with yeah. these great big giant yeah. versions. Um, Definitely going after the Tintin crowd. With Hilda that. In, the, in the Bird Parade. Awesome. And these are all uh, available now? Yep, at the they're all in the catalog, waiting to be processed, so you can put your holds on them and then wait to get them when they get ready. And Delilah Dirk is on order, right? Uh, yes, yeah. it is. Uh, Sharon actually, Sharon Iverson, the other yes. librarian who shows up on the show, she when I sent out the the links to the stuff we we're going to talk about today, she sent a, a frantic email there, like, oh, so we've got Reed Gunther in the yes. collection, and we're yes. getting Delilah Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant in the collection. We're going to make sure we have those. So, uh, yeah, Sharon's a huge fan of Delilah Dirk and Reed Gunther for that matter. So, guys, uh, anything that you want, any book recommendations you want to throw out for this episode? Uh, I just oh. got, it, it's not a, uh, there's not much of a narrative to it, but uh, I know both Chris and I just received our copies of Doug to Naples uh, sketchbook archives. It was uh, his Kickstarter thing that he did, and it's this, it's all the way over there, but it's this giant leather bound book with like gold along the edges of the pages and this nice little ribbon, and it's huge. It's like this thick of just sketches that he's done all the way back to like 1984 of projects of video games, TV, movie, and uh, comic stuff that he's worked on. And it's incredible just to like see that peek behind the curtain and see his uh, process and his like rough stuff and the stuff he wasn't happy with and the stuff he is happy with. Uh, that's always really nice to see kind of what an artist is working on. Cool. Well, on a related note, I would like to recommend um, Chris Schweitzer has a sketchbook. Yes. Um, and he has some very uh, insightful um, ideas on the art making process and creativity, uh, which I think are, are definitely worth looking into. His his Chris, sketchbook is amazing. Chris Schweitzer's sketchbook has a lot of text, hand printed text yes. too. I believe hand, he like it. Yes. It's amazing, and he gets really in depth into like why he's doing what he's doing and uh, how he's doing it. And it's, that's an incredible read uh, and has a lot more text to it. And it's just, yeah, Chris Weiser is the man. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I just read uh, Cena Grace is the artist on Little Depressed Boy through Image. And uh, he, on the side, just did a, a short graphic novel called Not My Bag and uh, also published through Image. And uh, it's really neat. It's it's kind of a little memoir. It's funny. It's it's uh, it's got some heartbreak in it, and it's all about his uh, journey of uh, working in retail before working mm -hmm. in comics. And he worked in like high high end retail and uh, sold designer clothes. And uh, it wasn't really what he wanted to do. And um, he tells the story in such a nice way. It's such a um, it's kind of Craig Thompson like, um, both in 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 the style it's drawn in and the the way he tells it. But it was really interesting and and some good thoughts on just uh, someone trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. Oh, cool! So not my bad. Yeah. <laughs> We will link to that in the show notes as well. All of these will be linked in the show notes. This will be archived at uh, comicsaregreat.com slash CAG77. Real quick, I want to throw out some announcements about events if you're in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area. Uh, first of all, this one actually is a global event. Uh, May 1st, today, as we're recording this, uh, Chris Giarosso's G-Man hit stores and uh, uh, 
a brother to the show, Greg Shegel of the Stuff Said Podcast, is holding a contest. And that's at StuffSaidShow.com. If you get the book in the next two weeks, you can be entered into the contest to win original art by uh, original SpongeBob art by Greg Shegel, who draws the SpongeBob comics. So that's awesome. There's a whole bunch of prizes at the at StuffSaidShow.com. And the book's out now. I'm going to go get my copy as soon as we're done recording. May 4th, as you guys said, is free comic book day. I'm going to be at Green Brain Comics, greenbrain.biz in Dearborn, Michigan. I'm going to be giving away sketches to kids all day long. Uh, I do it every year, and I usually wind up doing like two, 300 sketches uh, for kids in promoting. Kid, uh, kids each hour. Each hour, two to three hundred sketches each hour. It's incredible. It it yeah. It's just like it's it's like the sketches that uh, Chris did in his in the video that we were linking to earlier, where I draw a car made out of farts. <laughs> right. Uh, May fifth. Uh, Cinco de Mayo, Comics Artist Forum at the Ann Arbor District Library with Mike Roll. He's going to be doing an inking demonstration. We're going to learn about different inking tools and techniques. May 11th and 12th is TCAF in Toronto. Tony, please tell me you're going to TCAF. Unfortunately not. Sorry. Son of a gun. The one year I go, you don't go. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just going to be there walking around saying hi to people. I'm going to be there for high fives, but I'm not there to be there at the table. But a whole bunch of awesome cartoonists are going to be there, uh, including... Uh, there's that car crash that Chris was hinting at earlier. Uh, including Ann Arbor expat uh, Stephanie Mannheim is going to be there. So uh, that's at torontocomics.com. Then May 14th is Astronaut Academy Day. Uh, we're holding a contest to support Dave Roman's wonderful book, Astronaut Academy. That's at comicsaregreat.com slash AA Day. All you got to do is do some fan art or, or blog it or write a review, and you can be entered to win a whole bunch of awesome stuff, uh, almost 1,000 pages of digital comics. Hey, Chris... And uh, Shane uh, donated a digital comic, a copy of Reed Gunther, to the prize package. Uh, and then also an original portrait by Raina Telgemeier, original art by Kazu Kibuishi, original art by Rafael Rosado of Giants Beware. Uh, go to comicsgreat.com slash Day to check it out. And let's all try to build some buzz for Dave Roman's excellent, excellent book. I'm looking forward to that book so much. Yeah, man. I'm looking forward to it, too. And I'm also looking forward to Delilah Dirk, August 27th. Any other appearances, Tony, that you're going to be making? No, if you guys are in, um, if you guys are in Vancouver, um, yeah, book comes out on 27th. We'll be doing a gallery show uh, with some sort of roughs, originals, process painting. I'll be doing that with Rebecca Dart and a few other guests to be announced. Uh, that's coming up between the 14th and 30th of August. Um, I'm also also be at VanCaf, Vancouver Comics Art Festival. That's May 25th and 26th. Mm. Um, but uh, aside from that, I, haven't, I don't have any solid plans. Um, but yeah, come follow me at Tango Charlie or at Delilah Dirk on Twitter or TonyCliff.com. And you're on Tumblr, too. Uh, yes, I am. TonyCliff.tumblr.com. Okay, so that's where we can find you. Aaron, any ADL things that you want to make a shout-out for? Um, well, not until summer, but I'm extremely excited, non-comic related. I booked um, the most recent Top Chef winner. Oh, Who's really? <laughs> Who's from Michigan? So anyway, look oh, forward cool. to that in July. That's my. And that's that a was a my a big gift. Oh. Yeah. Aadl.org. Yeah. What's that? Sorry. B before we go, um, yeah. if you loved Ready Player One or you hated oh. Ready Player One, either way, I would recommend Snow Crash as well. It's Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. It's a bit violent. I don't know if it's very sexy, but uh, it's definitely. Um, I was a teenager when I first read it, and I enjoyed the heck out of that. Okay, cool. And that's probably in the library's collection as well, if it's, if it's a little bit uh, back in the catalog. Uh, Chris and Shane, where can we find you guys? Uh, all our Reed Gunther stuff is at reedgunther.com. Um, and then I'm on Twitter as Shane Houghton. Chris, you're on Twitter and Facebook. Can you spell that for people in case we can't see? Sure. Uh, Reed Gunther, I'll go with that first. It's R-E-E-D-G-U-N-T-H-E-R. And our last name, Houghton, is spelled H-O-U-G-H-T-O-N. Like Houghton Lake. Not, that's right. Not yeah, Houghton. right. Michigan. We can't say that now Now that we're out in L.A. because uh, <laughs> nobody's ever heard of Houghton Lake. No, they always, whenever they do, I see the national bro, uh, weather report, they're always like, oh, and Houghton Lake, it's this temperature. I'm like, hey, come on. I know you're from New York, but don't be a jerk. It's Houghton Lake. <laughs> uh, okay, and then Chris? Where, I, 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 see, I see you have a Twitter account, but I never see you post anything on Twitter. I, I know. I never post on Twitter. I'm sorry, my Twitter <laughs> followers. If, they're, if you're just sitting there waiting, <laughs> stop waiting. I only follow uh, one person, and he never posts. 
Um, but I am, I'm posting refresh, to, my, refresh. Uh, to my Tumblr more often nowadays, which is uh, Chris Houghton Art. So C H R I S H O U G H T O N A R T dot Tumblr dot com. And uh, yeah, I post little funny comics and. Uh, People ask me questions, and I, I try to respond to them in a funny way. And so come there to laugh. <laughs> Get ready to laugh. And uh, that's about it. I, I'm pretty much just posting on Tumblr right now. Oh, wait. I just remembered. We also have, uh, since we're talking about comics, Chris and I have a website called uh, rejectedcomics.com. Uh, and oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a Tumblr site of all of our comics that we've submitted to publishers and have been rejected. Uh, so if you'd like that peek behind the curtain, uh, rejected comics, uh, I think it's just reject. I haven't been there in a while. It's kind of old, but it's, uh, <laughs> still all good. We get this website. I don't know what it is, but, uh, <laughs> you guys have been in LA too long. You're starting to talk like LA people. Yeah. yeah right. Oh no. All right. Well, rejectedcomics.com. That's an awesome URL. Oh, that's not it. That's not it. I just looked oh. it up. I don't it's, think that's, that's another it. website. Dang. Is it rejected? Hold on. Oh no. <laughs> Never mind. Oh. Never mind. Forget I ever said anything. We'll link to it in the show notes for this episode. Uh, but <laughs> you're typing. Well, uh, whoever whoever has rejectedcomics.com. Uh, oh, ours is rejectedcomics.tumblr.com. Oh, uh, okay. That was close. 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 Rejectedcomics.tumblr.com. We will link to it in the show notes at comicsagreat.com. So, oh boy, guys, this was fun. We went way over, but uh, that's because you guys are you know 80 pounds of content in a 20 pound bag. You just can't you can't contain them. Don't try to stop them. So, uh, Tony, Cliff of DelilahDirk.com, uh, the Houghton Brothers of ReadGunther.com, thank you guys so much for this yeah, awesome thank conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Aaron Helmrich. Thank you, Jersey. Comics.adl.org. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to Kids Read Comics this summer. Yes. We'll be talking about it in the weeks to come. So, until next time, everybody, thank you to Matt Dubay and Eric Closter in the control room who have been uh, monitoring the chat and doing all the switching and all the roping all the cables like an octopus. Uh, until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.